Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are in the world. Welcome to this special event, Unlocking Your Potential with Paul Lindley. Today's event forms part of the University of Bristol Alumni Festival, which commemorates our 2021 Alumni Award winners and the ways in which they transform the lives around them. My name's Neil Coles and I'm here today as your host. My 20 years in schools, colleges and in higher education, I feel have really led me to this day. To interview a grown man that thinks like a toddler. More about that later. It's Paul Lindley we'll be interviewing. I really feel like uh, my three-year-old find the chocolate and sweet stash, which uh, I can assure you uh, they find regularly and, um, and there's marks on the carpet to show it. I've been uh, at Bristol now for six, seven years, and I recently joined the University of Flagship Centre for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, moving from a senior role in the career service. My roles have always been about supporting and connecting with entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs. I'm a true believer that the role model, that role models and in authentic learning experiences build a capability for being enterprising. Run alongside my role here at Bristol, I'm also a proud um, to be an Executive Director of Enterprise Educators UK, which is a national network of educational folk who su support entrepreneurial behaviours within their education. I mentioned uh, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs a moment ago, so let's tell you what, let's get a poll underway. Do you consider yourself to be an entrepreneur, an intrapreneur or neither? To make it simple, consider an entrepreneur as somebody who has the mindset of an entrepreneur, but works inside an organisation. While you're answering that on the poll feature, if you could uh, click entrepreneur, entrepreneur or neither on the poll feature. Also note that there's a Q&A tab where you can get in touch and ask questions of Paul Lindley when we, when, when we talk to him in a short time. The university has a proud reputation of entrepreneurial education and support from the fantastic Basecamp Enterprise team in the career service to the award winning Centre for Innovation and Entrepreneurship to colleagues in research enterprise development who help translate research into value for society and the widely known and widely respected Set Squared. Our first award winner today is Tom. Tom Carter has a footprint across the university enterprise ecosystem. Since winning the new enterprise competition in 2013, he has seen it all and had connections across the university. Before we move on to Paul Lindley, we would like to award an um, alumni award for innovation and enterprise to, Paul, to, to Tom Carter. I give you Tom Carter. It's really an honour. Um, the university has so many incredible alumni that uh, to receive an award is um, is really quite humbling. I would say learn how to learn, learn how to write and say yes. All of the most successful people that I know just never stop learning. To me, Connection is really about a shared journey. We've done something together, we've achieved something together. There's kind of like a, a joint purpose. The, the main thing I've learned through this is, uh, is that I really need to invest in my mental health. Running, meditating, journaling. If I do those three things, uh, they kind of keep me going. I'd say take the jump. When, when I was younger, growing up, I used to, uh, I, was, uh, I was shy and I would usually say no to things. Then I sort of had a point in my life where I kind of switched and just decided to say yes to stuff. Uh, and I've, I don't think I've ever regretted taking the jump on something that I was a little nervous about doing. Finding new perspectives is what keeps me uh, keeps me inspired. I think that's often where a lot of the best ideas come from. That's that where inspiration and innovation comes from is taking things that people haven't connected before and finding ways to connect them. 
we, we kind of grew up with this concept that making mistakes is bad, like you should try to avoid them. But realistically, like failing is a super important part of learning. Um, it's like one of the key ways that we learn and that we improve. Building friendships, uh, like time just building a, a, a large friendship network. You're all in the same place, you're all in the same boat, you all kind of have the same objectives. Um, society gets complicated after that. Many congratulations on your Alumni Award for Innovation Enterprise, Tom. We're delighted to have you part of the Bristol Alumni community. I can really see what Tom is saying there in terms of the ability to fail and the ability to take a jump. So thank you, Tom, for those uh, words. So can I just check in on the poll? Um, I can see, oh, there's lots of people um, been clicking, uh, clicking entrepreneur, entrepreneur. Uh, so we've got um, as, uh, oh, we, we've got uh, entrepreneur at 26% and, oh, entrepreneur is 3%. Is that 3% of, uh, of uh, oh no, sorry. So I'm saying this incorrectly. I'm reading it off uh, incorrectly. So 71% to say an entrepreneur, 26 intrapreneur and 3% neither. So um, we've got 71% as entrepreneurs out there. Thank you very much. Um, we've got 26% of you talking about being an intrapreneur and doing things positive within an organization. That 3% saying neither, well, I think we probably need a chat afterwards because I truly believe that everyone has entrepreneurial or entrepreneurial traits associated with them. And um, and if you'd be interested in finding out more about being um, entrepreneurial traits and entrepreneurial traits, you can head along to the University of Bristol Innovation Enterprise Conference, which is on the 15th of June. I'm hoping someone could drop something in a chat uh, moment to talk, uh, to tell people more about that event we've got coming up. But certainly those who are saying neither, you need to come along and, uh, and see what the traits are. So I must now focus on uh, the, well, I must focus on the today and that we've got Paul Lindley in the green room waiting alongside. And I am so excited. I feel like my three year old with the chocolate pot um, uh, uh, covering uh, covering the carpet in chocolate. Um, hello, Paul. Um, thank you. Hello. How are you? Hi, Neil. Very well. Thank you. Good. Um, just before we begin a formal welcome to you, uh, have you got any um, uh, reflections on what Tom just said? Yeah, um, it's just great to see that entrepreneurship and innovation is thriving and really truly alive in Bristol. Um, you've got a fabulous heritage down there as the, as the university that leads in this um, uh, for many, many years. Must be something in the water, I think. But it's just great to see him. Uh, and really, I think there's huge parallels between what he was saying and and what hopefully I'll have the opportunity to talk about in the next uh, the next few minutes. Um, I left Bristol 30 years ago, incredibly. I, I, I don't know where that time's gone, or clutching my degree. But in that time, I've had experience in business as an employee and as an entrepreneur, as an as a investor, uh, and as a, a board director. And I think the, the two areas that I really, really overlap with what Tom was saying was sort of on the big learnings about the way the world works uh, for me. Uh, all that 30 years of experience boils down to two things for me that I've learned. One is the world's about people. Business is actually about people. Teams matter, how you motivate people, how you inspire people. So, so teams and people are what's going to help you succeed. Uh, and the other thing is this idea of asking why all the time, just challenging stuff. Uh, perhaps it's even better to ask why not uh, when people tell you you can't do things. But, um, you know, understanding why drives you, it drives your purpose, it, it drives your decisions and your perspective of things too. So those macro sort of big world things I've learned, which I think overlap with, with Tom, but the specifics about it, what he was saying um, about how I've come to understand myself uh, really are echoed with, with what he said. I'll probably say them in different words, but, you know, my learnings, which I think are, are good advice for anybody starting an entrepreneurial journey, perhaps, you know, are... are um, I'll say his words in a different way, but it's really about being curious. I think it's tremendous skill to be curious about everything. It's question that that question why again. Be curious about everything. He spoke about learn to learn. That's the same thing. But then I think once you are curious, you've got to be brave as well. 
um, and, and take difficult decisions and, and sort of say yes, as he said, more often than no, but be brave to do that. And then about yourself, just be decent. It's, it, be a decent person because you want decent people to work with you and, and, and help you. And all of that sort of, sort of says, be you. <laughs> um, and it's so easy for us to, to, to kind of be vanilla. And we're, each of us are different and, and unique. And it's that specialness that's in us that will make a difference when we're starting a business or we're trying to make uh, an innovation or something new in the world. So I wrap all of that in, in my journey sort of reflection is what I've learned is around the importance of values and purpose, which um, comes to me every day because I've got a little quote uh, on my desk from Mark Twain from over 100 years ago now, and it just speaks to me. And I think it speaks to what Tom says, but I think it speaks to um, what all of us can think when we're um, leaving university and, and looking at the road ahead. Um, Mark Twain said, uh, in 20 years time, you will be more disappointed by the things that you didn't do rather than things that you did. So throw away the bow lines, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, and discover. That's what I've learned. Well, I, I, I think maybe we just end today uh, there with that, uh, that, that quote in there. Um, no, uh, th thank you, Paul. Um, just, to, just to let our audience know, so um, Paul graduated uh, in uh, uh, 1989. I was going to say 1899, <laughs> but um, 1989 um, with a BSc in economics and politics. And two years ago, you were awarded uh, an honorary doctor of laws. And we've been having a conversation probably for around half an hour before this uh, today. And we talked, we, we still stumbled on some of the things you've just mentioned there. But we talked about your uh, your book, uh, which is a forward from uh, Richard Branson. And uh, I'm actually reading at the moment. Um, I've got about 50 pages to go. Um, so, um, so I'll hopefully finish that tonight. Um, and you talked really, the thing I want to sort of pick up first is about the aha moment when you created um ella's kitchen which um is a, which became a brand that people know we see it across the supermarket still today you found this aha moment and you came from somewhere having been um what i'm understanding as an accountant working at nickelodeon and how did that come about can you just tell us a little bit introduce your career foundations um that led to that aha moment sure um well, I think all of us um, uh, live live life through our experience. We, our experiences direct how we live our lives. And, and so I, I can look back, that preceding that aha moment, I can think of little things along the way that sort of made that a reality or made, gave me the bravery to, to, to take that moment. I mean, I think back to Bristol, um, and, and actually this overlaps again with what Tom was saying, the, the don't be fear about making mistakes. Um, you know, I started Bristol um, uh, with a degree that uh, I knew straight away that I wasn't going to graduate with and I didn't uh, really enjoy or uh, I'd struggle with. And it was a mistake that the, the choice of the degree I'd made. For me, it was cellular pathology. Um, and after that first term, I thought, this is a mistake. I've got to learn from this. I've got to adapt and change and, and do facts quickly. And I went back to the uh, to the university and I said, look, I'd love to start again. And I'd love to do things that I really, that really kind of float my boat and, and economics and politics and social history were those things. And, and I got to change quickly. So I had the experience of failing and acting quickly to, to, to make that right. And then I loved my next three years um, at university and everything that that brought. And then also in Bristol, the sort of friendships with people and the understanding of others' experiences uh, and uh, and uh, and the ability to kind of my lifelong friends are from Bristol. My wife's from uh, uh, my, my my girlfriend when I, I was there. So, uh, but people who you can share your vulnerability with and you can explore viewpoints and ideas with is really critical for the rest of your life. And that sort of curiosity that uh, that universities bring anyway, um, it, it stayed lifelong with, with with me. So that sort of backstory means that sort of mm, fifteen years, maybe twelve years after um, after graduating, uh, and I'd been through an as an accountant, and I'd worked at Nickelodeon. Um, two other experiences collided together for me that gave me the confidence and the bravery to to to, um, to start Ellis Kitchen, and that was. Uh, first of all, that experience, the professional experience with Nickelodeon. So 
Um, I'd, uh, I'd worked uh, at, in, in that business that really it's all about putting kids first. Um, and I could see that uh, actually what it was trying to do in the context of television, where television was seen as a, as a bad sometimes for kids, that they watch um, the TV and didn't do exercise or they saw bad ads, and that, that there was an, uh, an overlap between kids watching more TV and kids getting less healthy each, each generation. Uh, and I was determined to try and, and, and do something around that. And I thought maybe this, there's a food, we, we, somebody should be able to create a brand of healthier food that kids would love. And maybe that person should be me. So that professional experience led me to the understanding that something needed to be done about helping kids get healthier as the generations go by. And then secondly, um, I had my own children. Um, and and my, my first child, my daughter, Ella, uh, was born. And the experience of trying to wean her and the fact that she uh, loved food and then suddenly stopped food, eating some foods when she was sort of uh, eight or nine months and, and, and just my silliness and games and mess and, and, and that's the sort of stuff that I'm good at made her laugh and open her mouth. And I realized that if you could make food fun for kids, um, you uh, had the best chance of getting them to eat healthy food because it was all about stimulating all of their senses. So bringing those two things, two things together, I thought I've got uh, my, I've got my why. I've got uh, I've got my mission here. I, I hope to be able to create a brand of healthy, great food for kids uh, that kids will love because it's fun and it's it's stimulating all of their senses. Uh, and that's what we, we went off and do. So that's the kind of the backstory. But then, sort of in getting to market, um, had to innovate in so many different ways because uh, baby food at that time had been the same for probably two or three generations, all orange, all in a jar, very few brands and a kind of loss leader for, um, for, for the supermarkets. And we had the bravery, I had the bravery, I suppose, to uh, play with new recipes and mix things together that people hadn't done before, especially fruits and vegetables. Uh, different kind of packaging, brand new kind of packaging, tactile and appeal to children, different kind of branding, uh, around my family and my our real story and the authenticity of that and the fact that we weren't a, 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 a corporate trying to engage a consumer. We were a family trying to engage with another family and share experiences. Um, our marketing, we did it in a very different way. And I guess the business philosophy that I had, I didn't set off saying, I'm doing this to try and make money. I'm doing this. My purpose was to try and help kids um, have, have a healthier life and have a better relationship with food. Uh, I could make money by doing that, I felt, with all those innovations, and so set off from that. And delighted to say um, that uh, it took off and within seven years was the biggest uh, baby food brand in the, in the UK. It's uh, with a 35% market share and growing, uh, made money from, from, from day one, uh, and is now in 50 countries. And um, it's all built upon that mission and everything around it. Wow. Um, it, it, interestingly, one of the questions that just came in to us was about uh, the bravest, boldest decision you made in terms of business. Just as you were talking about um, how, the bold decision you made in terms of jumping into Alice Kitchen. So I think you've already uh, sort of answered that for some of our listeners. So thank you. Um, you mentioned there a little bit about values. And you talked about how, and, and I know from reading your book and uh, our previous engagements, uh, you're deep seated in uh, the citizenship of business. And I ask this because um, I work in the Centre of Innovation and Entrepreneurship, and we focus on uh, supporting students to focus, think about the a human centered design approach, effectively, who is it you're aiming this for? And you mentioned just a short time ago, ago about how you were one family trying to connect with another family and with the with the brand of Alice Kitchen. So why is it, do you think, is important to focus on the users when developing new innovations? Um, that's a great question because it again speaks to the heart of how I see the world, I think. It's, it's around people. You know, we've kind of, we're in danger of losing humanity from decision making, from our institutions. We're divorcing, um, you know, economics from society, the economy from society, and uh, and it's really important that, that we bring things back to, you know, the point. What's the, the what's the point of ourselves, and what's the point of a business? I and mean, it, it's kind of to improve things. Um, and the best businesses improve other people's lives, and, and can 
um, think from the consumer or the other, the other person's point of view as to why what they're producing, whether it's a, a product or a service, will will help them. Um, so, so I always start everything from the human being, and there's I, I, ideas fascinate me. You know, they're they're where, why do some become reality and others don't? Some good ones just get stuck on the shelf or don't happen, and and the they are just a, a unique human trait. You know. No other animal can 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 have a, a concept of something that doesn't exist and make it exist, uh, and that's how I think we should start thinking about how, how our businesses are. If we've got an idea, how can we communicate and collaborate and prototype and then iterate and innovate to help that idea become something? And we can only do it with other people, but other people motivated to try and make that happen with a clear understanding of what they what outcome they're trying to do. So. You know, I, I think if we work on our whys, as I, I said, why, why are we doing this? What drives us to do it? We'll get the ideas that will resonate most. And then once you've got your why, you can work out your how, how to do it, because the planning is absolutely critical. All that time spent at the very beginning in working out, you know, how you're going to get it to market, how you're going to do it at a margin, how are you going to be able to scale, how are you going to be able to market it? Those sort of things are critical to be thought about in front. So that's your how. But, but, uh, and, and, and including the who. who, who's going to help you do this? Other people again, your team, your investors, your suppliers, how are you going to engage your customers? And, and then you get to your what, what your, what your idea is really. So your what becomes really after your why and your how and your who you're working with. But, but, but if you see your, your what you're doing, what your idea is through that lens of people, you know, and their why, why they may buy it, you will um, succeed, I think. So human beings have to be at the center of every single sort of, not just business decision, but, but sort of uh, public decisions that we make. Well, thank you. Um, I, I, as you were just speaking then, I actually picked up your, your book again. I was having a little flick through uh, at, um, at something. And, um, and I recently also noted that you have um, recently joined the board of um, Sesame Workshop, which for our listeners is the not-for-profit behind Sesame Street. Your book is called uh, The Huge Power of Thinking Like a Toddler. My question here is, why is it, what is it about how young people think that intrigues you? What is it that young people what, what the way they think? What is it that intrigues you? Okay, well, oh, you're on my my the heart of my best favorite subject here now. So, so first of all, Sesame Workshop, Sesame Street. You know, just what a wonderful organization. You know, I I, I love to think Ellis Kitchen um, is the best company in the world, and we've got the best mission statements and the best reason for being there. But it's you know maybe it's a close second to Sesame. Sesame's mission. I wish it was the the mission of human beings, or wish mission of this country. Their mission, they do everything around this in, in, in playing out their business. It is to help kids grow smarter, stronger, and kinder. And they do that through media and through education, and it's just wonderful. But So uh, I'm really privileged to work with them. I learned so much. Um, but because they, their heroes are, are, are young children, um, uh, you know, who are my heroes? Uh, I'm really, you see me today, this gray hair and uh, this, this aged face, but... Um, I'm just a little boy inside of this body, and I haven't changed my outlook of the way I think about things since I was, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, and that's why I, I can really resonate and be inspired by toddlers uh, and, and young children because they, they, don't, they don't come at the world, and I'm saying they, remember every one of us was, was that person at one time. We, we at that time didn't come to the world uh, cynical or criticizing things. We had this open mindset. You know, we had free thinking. We had an imagination that anything was possible. We had the confidence to speak our minds. Um, and that's what my, my book is really about. It's really saying, look, the best people we ever were was when we were a toddler um, and we imagined the world in this way and, and we questioned it uh, and we um, were creative and we made friends and we were honest and we played our way to iterate things. Um, and all things that we lose as we grow older. So if you want to unlock your best potential, the best you, my advice is to grow down. And at some, some stage each day, maybe just for five minutes, try and get to a place to remember how you were, you as an individual, 
um, wh when you were four or five years old, or if you've got children or you see children around uh, closely, just see how they think and go about the world. Because, you know, when we, just say when we were six, we must have thought, God, life's brilliant, because I've got another eight years to live, and I've learned all this stuff in the first six years of my life. It's just going to keep learning. And the sad thing is, for many, many people, is that we conform and we stop uh, uh, exploring um, and we go to that safe harbor that, uh, that, that Mark Twain was telling us to go out of. And, um, you know, in quite honesty, if, you know, we're, trying, we're going to solve some of the society and the global problems that we've got, or if we're entrepreneurs and we're trying to create something that doesn't exist at the moment, we've got to think differently than others have thought before. And we've got to be able to be prepared to make mistakes. And we've got to play with others and make friends with others and imagine things that don't exist um, and make them happen. And, and therefore, you know, the, the idea that, that uh, we can learn from toddlers, it's not just them learning from us, is at the heart of why I think, um, you know, I've, I've had a successful business career um, and, you know, our society could be much more uh, uh, adaptable for the future if we, if we thought about a child-powered future in of itself. Uh, and I, I'm, ju I'm just sort of going to read off just uh, uh, some words back at you, if I could. Uh, and <clears throat> the, no the nine points of the book is, is structured around is be confident, be creative, dive right in, never give up, get noticed, be honest, show your feelings, have fun, involve others. And I think that's uh, involve others is a really nice uh, way to end on that uh, that, that, that point there. Um, I'm just looking across at the uh, questions coming in from our audience and uh, we've got um, quite a few people upvoting uh, a particular question which relates to um, uh, you, you, you relates to the values element and it says um, as your business has grown have you had to make compromises in your original ethos and your values and how do you balance that and how have you um you, how, how is that how is that sat with you in terms of having to make uh, compromises in in your values or anything yeah. else yeah really good question um i think um i think values are are, are almost immovable they're, they're the way you see the world they are you that's what makes you 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 know and and you know, many people on this call today won't become entrepreneurs ultimately, but will be involved in work and in business. And you work, if you're not going to create your own work, you want to work in a place that reflects your own values. So in some ways, those values aren't compromisable. What is, what is the real world is how those values can be um, adapted or implemented or reflected in the work that, that, that you do. And, you know, I'm very much against the idea of planning your life out and planning when things are going to happen and, and planning one individual route of this is the road that we're going to go on. I more more see, in my little head, I think about it as getting in a rowing boat at the edge of, of a shoreline and aiming across a bay to a lighthouse. And I know I'm going to get to the lighthouse. That's my, my anchor. But, you know, the waves are going to take me, the tide's going to take me, the wind's going to take me, I'm going to get tired, I'm going to go faster in other times and slower. But I know kind of where I'm going. I know exactly where I'm going, but I know I don't need to go in that straight line. And so if you anchor your whole life in asking questions about values and who, what your values are, and it is really worth time sitting down and, and picking four or five that really resonate with you and looking for jobs or creating jobs uh, around them. But... but um, you know, r reflect on the greater picture and, and, and um, it, it, when each individual situation comes along. But, but really, as soon as you start going against your values, when you think nobody's looking, because you think you can, because you think you're under pressure to get away with something, then I think that um, is uh, 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 the beginning of the journey to uh, away from success. Um, so, uh, you know, values aren't specifics, they're kind of broad. So get broad things that you can navigate through, uh, but say, you know, I don't know, honesty is, is, is a value that many people um, uh, value and, and aspire to. You know, so if, if your employer or if your major customer is not honest with you, you know, that's, you've got, to, you've got to question whether you want to work with those people because it's kind of, kind of getting worse, especially when you get investors in board, on board. I would especially say, you know, value alignment with investors it, it, it is absolutely critical. So 
really what you're saying in terms of um, everyone involved in the business needs to co to um, consider the values and connect with it. And one of the questions that actually just come in as well is how do you keep connected with everyone who works within an organisation? You've started Ella's Kitchen from you know the kitchen table named after your daughter uh, with the family and how then as that that grew that grew and grew, grew to the point of exit on that uh, on that that firm how do you keep in touch and keep those values connecting through the organization and uh, and you know your your own um, connections with and yeah. connect with the people that then work for you yeah um i'd say uh, two, two ways really one is um the values have to be embedded within the culture and the processes and systems of the organization. It's, it's no good whatsoever saying, okay, these are my values, I'm going to stick them up on the wall, everyone can see them, and then we'll just get on with our day-to-day -day work of doing our individual jobs. Because our individual jobs won't sum to something greater than our individual jobs if they're not linked by values and reflective of values. So embed it in the culture, recruit people based on mindset, that have those values as much as skills, or even more so than skill set. Reward people, promote people, um, feedback about people, listen to people, let the world outside, if you're a, a brand, know that these are your values. Because if you're a brand trying to sell a consumer product and you say, well, these are our brand values, and you don't reflect them within the culture of your organization, you're screwed. Um, you, you just give up now because um, brands start from the inside, not from the outside. Um, so that's that's one area. Sort of really embed it. Think about you know in Ellis Kitchen we got um, what's uh, we call them the uh, keeping people happy team, but it, it's really the HR department. Uh, really early on, I think we were about thirty people because we wanted to ensure that what was in my head and the few first people that started could be reflected into the processes and systems and the way we work. This is who we are. So um, uh, really, that's uh, the first thing. Um, and then the second thing uh, around uh, values is, is, is really to make sure that you reward people as much by the internal validation and rewards that they're looking for as much as the external. What I mean is it's easy in a kind of less human way to say, oh, these people are working for us. We're going to pay them. Uh, we're going to give them a bonus based on financial performance. Uh, we're going to give them a title. And a you know, an office or a desk, and, uh, and you know, they'll, they'll feel rewarded with all those external things. But I think, you know, most people, as well as those, are really value internal rewards. A simple thank you. So a CEO of a business, who, who, whoever they are, however big that business is, part of their job is to go around thanking people for no, and letting them notice that, you have, that they have done, you know, their job or more than their job or help promote the mission and the vision of the company. So, um, uh, that, that sort of uh, you know, simple rewards like that, connectedness, allow people to make mistakes and, and have the autonomy to make mistakes. Allow them to master a subject and um, and have continual learning uh, because you understand who they are. And not, don't make it vanilla for everybody. Try, as, especially easier with smaller businesses, to try and make bespoke learning opportunities for people because we're all individuals and we all want to learn at different rates and do different things. But but so so. My, my learning and I guess my leadership style is, is really human based. And, and, you know, I think you get so much more out of people with simple thank yous, simple recognition of you notice that somebody had to get up early, stay late, think about things that, you know, and, and all of those kind of things that they're not necessarily paid for in their contract. That's what you get magic. You get people staying longer. You get people thinking about things in the shower and at the weekend and, uh, and, 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 talking about your business to others, not in terms of this is the functional job I do, but this is the emotional things that I do. Um, and this, that's what makes me feel proud to work for the company that I work for. So it's leadership around that sort of emotional maturity of recognizing individuals is vital. Um, <clears throat> I'm really going back to the one of the early things you said in the when talking that answer through was the department of keeping people happy department. Um, I, I just love it um, in terms of the the functionality um, within the organisations it grew. Just to um, flip it a little bit in terms of 
some of the things that you and Tom mentioned at the outset of uh, uh, today's session was about mistakes. And I think we can um, consider that um, we are in a position where where we actually value, we should be valuing mistakes and learning from them. I think you've talked about, about that, that aspect. But can you just talk us through um, maybe one of the biggest mistakes you feel you've you made and what you learned from it and uh, and the importance of that? Yeah, so you're there, they're, you're there critical, you know, and, and it's really if just I'll, I'll go a macro view first, like a helicopter view of why they're so vital in our world, and then I'll talk about my uh, one or two of my mistakes. But they're vital because if we don't try new things, we'll never learn, learn fund learning fundamentals as we'll never improve the world. Because if we always do what we always did, we'll always get what we always got. You know, the big problems in the world, I chair London's Child Obesity Task Force, a really complicated problem. There's 40% of our kids in London are at an unhealthy weight. How do we change that? Well, we're not going to change it by trying to do the exact things that we've tried to do for the last 30, 50 years in trying to solve it. We've got to try new things. And as we try new things, some of those will fail. And that's a good thing because we'll learn from that and then we'll iterate and we'll work out what we've learned from that is a good thing. We'll, we'll, um, we'll um, maybe find a solution. So, you know, in business life, it's, um, you know, the, the idea that we pay bonuses on, you know, growing 5% or something as a, as, as a financial performance one year. Well, maybe we shouldn't grow at all this year. We should try something that's going to fail, learn from it, and make a much better product next year or the year after, and grow 50% the, the, the year after. So how do we incentivize people to build that, that failure and that sort of autonomy to be able to make those mistakes into our lives? So, so my failures, of which I have made many, um, you know, I, we're talking about Ella's Kitchen today. Now, I have two children. Uh, my other son is uh, Paddy. Uh, my, my son is Paddy. And um, I, I started something called Paddy's Bathroom after Ella's Kitchen, which um, was, was um, uh, natural bathroom products like bubble baths and shampoos uh, that kids could find fun getting clean as much as they did to get dirty. I thought it was, I thought it was a great concept. I thought we could kick into and, and work with and, and inspire the people who bought Alice Kitchen. Um, and um, I put together a team and I did two big mistakes. One is I didn't listen to what people wanted out of their bathroom products. I just assumed because they wanted certain things for their food products for their kids, um, that the, the, the same things would happen. So went to market with the wrong packaging because I thought that it should be similar packaging to the food completely different occasion. Um, I didn't listen about um, the, the price point that they were prepared to pay, those sort of things. But then I also didn't get into the weeds from the very beginning and take ownership from, from managing the company. I, I, I brought in a, a, a managing director uh, from the very beginning and I didn't understand my company as much as I should have done. And uh, you know, I, it was my, my mistake and my fault that uh, that, that company, we're not talking about that company because it doesn't exist anymore uh, because we couldn't get the volume and the, the, the growth to see a way to profitability. Um, and I put that down to the mistakes that I made uh, in hindering the team in, in, in developing what we what we could have done. So recognition of mistakes um, is vital. And, you know, as I said, with my experience, of, uh, when I first went to Bristol, uh, you know, recognize them, admit them, correct them, learn from them and move on. Yeah, um, great words because um, we, you know we, we we do need to learn from our mistakes and actually uh, being able to to state our mistakes because the the sort of role models out there we always just talk about the 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 wins and the things that uh, that have come off uh, come off well and it is important to uh, to recognise that everyone builds and, and and learns in a different way and different um, diff at different times. I'm actually. Um, uh, we've actually got some questions, if you wouldn't mind, from some students who've sent in some videos to us. Um, and if you wouldn't mind answering those questions, we we're, we're able to run those. But if I can just explain where the questions have come from and where the students uh, who have asked these questions have come from. So, okay. the, uni so the University of Bristol um, tomorrow will be celebrating the new enterprise competition final. And actually, Tom Carter, who uh, was was um, we, we spoke with earlier. Um, was actually a previous winner of the new enterprise competition in 2013. Um, the new enterprise competition um, is awarded tomorrow and there's 10 uh, fabulous finalists um, going to be awarded uh, um, some funds and thank you to the sponsors of that um, the new enterprise competition. 
I wonder if um, if uh, one of my colleagues can pop a, a link for anyone watching who would like to attend that event tomorrow. But if I can um, just now run the VT of the questions. So I've always wanted to say that. Run VT. Here's the questions. Hello, we are VVD Everplanet. My name is Nuresa and I'm studying biology. I'm Fico and I'm third year student majoring in aerospace engineering. My name is Vincent and I'm in my final year studying computer science. Hello, my name is Jonathan and I'm a third year civil engineering student and I'll be introducing the team. We are a student startup aimed towards sustainability. Our product entails a smart indoor farming device that aims to improve food transparency and tackle food vulnerability. We have secured 700 pounds thus far throughout the ideation and development stage of the Basecamp Enterprise competition and are looking into the growth stage of the startup. Last but not least, I would uh, like to pass the spotlight to Vincent for a question. So our question for Paul is, do you have any advice for us in transitioning from a project into a sustainable business? For example, is there any recommended, recommended way for us to put our project into production? Thanks. Thank you, Vincent and team. Uh, wonderful. Um, well, first of all, food, great. You've picked um, a sector um, that everybody um, is involved with. We all eat, we all talk about food, we all have opinions about it. Um, and also it's prime for innovation and improvements and, and new opportunities. So um, into a sector that's always thrive in my, my view and always need uh, new ideas to come from it. Um, so that, that really question, conundrum of how to go from something that's really small in an idea and kind of ideation stage to something that's commercial and sustainable and scalable um, is a, a critical one, obviously. Um, so from my experience and my thinking, um, uh, I would suggest that perhaps you get a pilot plant um, uh, 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 and, and start small so that you know, uh, take, can take step by step uh, understanding of how the process works of getting your final, um, your, your final uh, product out there. So make mistakes, make the mistakes while it's small and, and iterate it uh, as you seem to be doing. Um, I would then, um, I would use research and, and feedback constantly, but I would treat research as in customer research a little bit um, as advice rather than being sacrosanct because you're asking people what they would do if something. Better thing is to just test it in a small real life test where people have to buy it at arm's length and they can feedback honestly whether it was worth the money, whether it did what you said it did, and all of those things. So, so by all means, use market research to understand whether there's an appetite there. And, uh, but, but really start by trying to do some real life small testings where people spend their time and their money, and, under, and you understand why they are spending their time and their money on buying your product. So, I think success is all about understanding motivations. Um, and I also you said about seven hundred pounds, and obviously you're going to need to scale that and get investment. But perhaps. You know, crowdfunding um, is, is an opportunity here for you. It doesn't sound like you're going to need masses. And perhaps with some crowdfunding, you, could, you can get prepayments rather than give equity away. Um, and um, so maybe look at Indiegogo and places like that. But um, I, I think the final thing I would reflect as you're, you're saying that, and I think as I understood it, it's, a, it's, it's for consumers rather than a business-to-business -business opportunity. You'll have the tech, and I'm sure it'll be fabulous, and you can scale it, and you can iterate it and build it. But I think your your story about why you've done it, your why, and how you can explain that to others um, is might be critical to your success. So I'd think about that now. How how what are the life experiences that led you for guys to be able to do this and be authentic around this? Because I think you'll capture the hearts um, as well as um, the wallets and cut through the white noise. Um, that is bound to be around the sector that you're in. So I hope that's helpful. Hello, my name is Enrico Verano, and I graduated in engineering design from Bristol in 2018. I'm now halfway through a neuroscience PhD at Imperial College London. But together with Milo Edi, also from Bristol, we founded Circle R. Circle R is a reusable packaging online supermarket with fast zero emission deliveries. We partner with brands to create an integrated fulfillment service for their reusable packaging products, collect the empties from our customers on the next delivery, clean them and return them to our brand partners for them to go through a cycle again. Got a question for you. Um, you built what is considered a leading purpose-led British business. In your opinion, 
Is there going to be space for businesses that are not ESG led in five years time? Or will greenwashing continue to increase due to poor environmental education? Thanks. Oh, love the question. Love the whole subject around this. Um, it, it's the heart of kind of what I, I'm an activist and a campaigner for. Um, so I'm hopeful that in five years time, things will be core to success in business that now aren't seen to be core for all businesses. And uh, I think this experience of this last 18 months of the pandemic and this determination to build back better um, is will be a step change in, in that, you know, kind of a, a positive, I guess, that comes out of so much difficulty this last year. Because we, we, we do look back as uh, uh, to, gosh, how did we set up an economic system or, or, or a society or, or, or greenwashing, as you say, without evidence behind it um, uh, 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 and believe it. So I think that values will need to be shown transparently going forward. Ethics will be an increasing driver of a number of purchasing decisions. Um, I, I think um, in this next five years, we will seek to reset the social contract, if you like, between society and the economy or businesses and the economy. And we will question whether, you know, it, it is fair that um, businesses were, or directors of businesses get limited liability uh, and those businesses might create things that are bad for society of which those businesses don't have to account for, called the externalities. Um, and um, we, we'll question the rest of us that aren't in that business or aren't in business, we'll question whether that's a fair fair, fair um, uh, uh, exchange for that limited liability. So um, I think, you know, businesses are a force for good. Business is this force for good. And I think in these next five years, we've got an opportunity to make it real and make all businesses do that by a combination of three things. Um, I think legislation will increasingly demand it, and we should all put pressure and try and find enlightened politicians that can reset the economic system so, so that it works for all, um, reduces inequality, creates prosperity, um, and I think we can look at things with the, with the Companies Act there. I think people will decide that um, they're only going to buy from or work for um, businesses that are transparent and, um, uh, and do good, uh, especially Generation Z. As, as, as you know, recent graduates and, uh, and young people are coming into the workplaces, they will want an alignment of their values with where they work. They will want to feel as though they're getting more than a, than a paycheck and they will challenge and question um, uh, through their wallets and through their voice as to what companies are saying about themselves and what they're, they're selling. And then finally, I think um, the investment community is increasingly stepping up with ESG portfolios, uh, questioning about environmental and social and governance issues uh, as they invest in the bigger companies and, and those scaled companies that are trying to get more money in will need to um, uh, uh, account for that. So I think greenwashing has had its day. I think um, uh, tighter definitions and reporting uh, and transparency around what, what companies will do. And I, my, the prototype for this is, is B corporations. Um, I guess this is a, a takeaway from today that I'd ask you to go and Google and look up. It's about B corporations. They're a different kind of company. They're trying to be the best company in the world, not just the best company, or be yeah, best company for the world, not just the best company in the world. Uh, and they're a proto prototype of what I hope all companies uh, will be. And I'm really, really proud that Ellis Kitchen was one of the first uh, B corporations in the UK. Good luck. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for um, answering some of those questions um, that were from the early stages of the new enterprise competition. Um, <clears throat> some of the questions, i am just been monitoring some of the questions coming in uh, while you were talking about those points there. Um, and I'm particularly uh, drawn to one around how do you find the right people to work within your organization how do you find the right people to work with your organization and that is something connected with being the leader of the organization or if you are working within an organization you're building a team in any way so how do you find the right people to 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 work mm. with mm. Um, by taking the time at the interview and the recruitment stage to um to ensure that there's a, an alignment of, of mindset. This comes back to values ultimately, I think. But you know, we all want to work with people that, that are on our wavelength, that we get energy from, that we can be open with and ourselves with and, and are likewise in, in return. So I actually think um, for most jobs, 
Um, there's, a, there's a bar of, of which people need to be above for skill sets and experience and qualifications, obviously. But the differentiator between those people that are above that bar is less the 1% better at the skill than the one person is than the other, but it's more the 1% more aligned in values and aligned in way of looking at the world um, than, than, um, than, than, than the skill itself. So um, recruiting on mindset and then having a culture that rewards um, the, pe the person, not just the role, um, uh, and helps get the most out of people. So, for example, um, at Ella's Kitchen, you know, there's loads of things that we did from um, uh, ensuring that everybody that had been there for over a year um, had a share in the company, and therefore they felt ownership. That share wouldn't have been worth very much in of itself. There were millions of shares, but it felt ownership. It felt as though they were being, they were part of, they were part of something um, a long term. Um, but then just a simple thing is, you know, the company paid for uh, lunches once a week for everybody to sit down together and paid for everybody to go out and do something that they hadn't done before uh, once a year um, and come back and talk to the group about it that they've always wanted to do um, and paid for clubs and, and stuff outside of work time. All of those things were designed to get people together so that they could talk to each other and understand each other and find that we've got similar mindsets find that they, um, different jobs that they do, help each other uh, and form a community and form um, a support network as, as a team. And so um, I think, as I've hopefully been saying for this last half an hour, an hour or so, it, it's really try to reward the person and the inside of the person um, in, your, in your recruitment and in your culture and in your policies uh, that, that, that to give out rewards. Um, that's, that's wholeheartedly where I come from. And that is also just the, the flip side of that is really good to hear for for our graduates who are going out into the workplace who are actually either starting up themselves or are looking for employment in places. And certainly coming from a, a, a leader in career service, we would always say, look at the values of the organisation and consider yourself alongside that. Look for the right type of place that you want to work. So I think, you know, on the flip side of that, you know, it's great to hear. Say Neil, on, on that, you know, people on this call are not only graduates, of which they're incredibly privileged um, to be, but they're, they're University of Bristol graduates, the top 1% of, uh, of, of university of, of, of graduates in, in, in the country and probably in the world. And, and, and you know, you, with that, you can go out and be uh, confident um, uh, that you get a, a privileged position to be able to choose what you do uh, more than many other people. And with that, go and challenge the companies that you're doing interviews for. Don't just take it, okay, ask them what their values are and then challenge them. Okay, how do you live that every day? What will I see when I come into your company that shows me that you are living those values? How will my job live those values? How will I be rewarded for being, understanding and promoting those values? I would ask all of those questions because you, because of the privileged position that you're in and the opportunities that you're going to have, use them because you can make the best not only for your own career, but for the companies that you work for and ultimately in changing the world. So um, be confident around that, absolutely. And I would add, use your uh, University of Bristol networks that you can connect with. And for those on the call, um, the University of Bristol has a Bristol Connects. I'm sure someone can drop it into the uh, to the links now for anyone who wanted to join that that network. And actually, uh, you can see other people who are alumni and connect with them and uh, and make those connections uh, sort of build from there. So use those networks as well um, that the, the come from Bristol. Um, I think we're, we're we're nearly up on time, Paul. Um, I, I I feel like the, I could do another two to three hours here, um, but uh, but uh, I, we are coming to a close. Um, just before we do, is there anything else that you'd like to um, sort of uh, bring up or highlight um, as part of your career, or anything else you'd like to say to our audience here today? Well, I was I was thinking about that, you know, when I. Um, I was thinking about two years ago when I was so humbled to be honoured with, with, with the honorary degree that, that I got, and I spoke in the same hall exactly 30 years after I got my first degree uh, in, in the Great Hall area at um, the university, um, about, this, the, the, about the idea that as you're leaving university and going out into the world, whether you become an entrepreneur, going to business or do other things, 
the way you are going to make a difference is two things. One is by being you and not compromising on what you believe in and you know what your values are and you know not being cowed into not speaking up when you think there's something wrong uh, or challenging and, and nudging the world to a different place because uh, because you're you. Employers will be looking, and investors, if you're an entrepreneur, will be looking for the uniqueness about you and the belief in you that you can deliver the business plan or do the job. So always be you. Never compromise on that. Never, my view, never just merge into the crowd. Stand out. Um, and then uh, I think the, the, the second thing is remember that your success, however unique you are and great you are, is never going to be found out by anybody else unless you embrace other people, learn from other people, share with other people, not because of just what you're going to get out of it, but because what they're going to get out of it as well. So if you're a decent person doing decent things with other people, they will be decent for you. And however great you are, you're not going to be great unless other people help you along the way um, and build your team, but just common decency. So they're the two, the two things. Um, and I think, you know, the, the skills I think I've learned over those years, if we're looking for specifics of skills, qualities of true kind of leadership and true self-fulfillment, you know, are around an emotional maturity to be able to, to take knocks, make mistakes, learn from them and bounce back better, to always strive for continuous improvement in what you're doing, that curiosity and that sort of resilience to, to try and always improve what you're doing. We can always do better, I believe. Recognize teams and work with teams and people as I've just said. Be really persuasive in your communications, um, you know, asking the questions of why and stuff and, uh, uh, and really communicating with clarity. And then finally, just seeing the bigger picture, you know, uh, you know, each of us is, is one in what, eight billion of us. Um, you know, we've got to work with each other um, and, and see the bigger picture. And, and, you know, that kind of comes back full circle to what we were talking about and even what Tom was talking about at the very beginning. Find your purpose, set your course because of, because of that and then be really ambitious and determined and resilient in, in trying to weave your way to get to what you believe your purpose in life was. Leave your legacy on this uh, world when, 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 when the time is to leave it um, because of the decisions that you took um, early in your life and in, early in your career. Um, that's what I've learned uh, from a grey-haired man that left Bristol 30 years ago. Um, it sounds as if you've still got a lot in you, so uh, I don't think uh, you should just be placing yourself in that uh, sort of uh, bracket. So thank you so much, and thank you so much for your time today. I'm I'm really sorry we've only got a, uh, we, we've only got an hour with you, but I'm I'm hoping that uh, we can catch up again um, uh, soon. So for now, and it's just for me to sort of thank you and congratulate you on your award for business and industry, your alumni award for business and industry. And and I really, really hope you will bring out another book because um, with just 50 pages left, um, I really um, would like to carry on reading and I look forward to, uh, to, to meeting you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Thank you. And, um, you know, I guess the way we can extend this hour is by um, seeing if people want to get Little Wins, that book, and uh, discover some of the things I was saying there, but um, some more yeah. in addition. Thank you. So, um, well, that, that was uh, pretty amazing. I've really, really enjoyed the last uh, hour of uh, time, and I hope you have as well. So for me now, uh, it's for me to really sign off and say uh, goodbye to everyone, and thank you for um, joining us today. So I just wanted to sort of highlight what's coming up in the, um, in the next couple of weeks, really, as part of the University of Bristol. So tomorrow, we mentioned before, the new enterprise competition, and you'll find a link in the chat uh, if you want to come along to that and see some of the brilliant uh, startups coming out of the university. And then this Monday, um, as part of the Alumni Festival again, uh, we've got Sir Paul Nurse. And having met and talked to Sir Paul Nurse previously, you're in for a real treat there. Uh, if you use the left hand navigation bar, you will uh, be able to <coughs> check into that event. Then on the 15th of June, uh, on the morning of the 15th of June, the University of Bristol Innovation and Entrepreneurship Conference and Showcase. Uh, we'll be discussing lots of themes around innovation and entrepreneurship, and uh, we'll be showcasing, showcasing even um, some emerging talent. 
uh, from the university's unique innovation programs. Everyone's um, welcome and please um, come along and join us um, and keep connected to our uh, to the to the Bristol network. So. Um, it's just for me now to say uh, thank you. And there is a short survey, right, which will pop up at the end if you could just uh, click that link. And, uh, and also just please stay in touch. And we look forward to uh, seeing you again at another future event.